No, one, two more weeks after this. Okay. We've got two more weeks. So yeah, this week we're going to see how far we get through session five and then the next two weeks. All right, Steve, thank you very much. So you are hearing me on the audio ministry. Uh, the next two weeks we're going to get into session six, which is everything kind of post-resurrection, uh, post-ascension. So what happens in the book of Acts? Obviously, there's a whole lot that happens in Acts, and we're not going to be able to cover all of it within two weeks, but we're going to hit some of the high notes. And then we're also going to talk a little bit about the, the 12 apostles and what historians say. Uh, we don't know for sure if it's not in Scripture, but what historians say happened to them. So we'll see how quickly we can get through them. We probably won't dig too deep into that, but there's some interesting things. A couple of housekeeping items. If you guys... Um, haven't signed in yet, please do so before you leave. You don't have to get up and do that now, but it helps Susie if she's taking attendance. And if you don't have a handout, we've got some over there. Um, if you have last week's, that'll probably serve you well. I added one additional section at the bottom, but I'm not sure if we'll get to it or not. Um, so, But I, I printed out, so it's just session five on the handout. If you don't have a Bible with you, we've got plenty over there. You can grab that, although they are NIV, and I'll be going from the ESV. Don't worry about that. They're pretty close. They're at least close enough that you'll be able to follow along. All right. As everybody's getting settled now, let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you are the giver of all good things. Lord, we thank you for giving us your word. We thank you for giving us your son. We thank you for the opportunity to study your word and, and learn what your son came to do for us and what he still does for us today. As we dig into the scriptures, Lord, send your Holy Spirit to enlighten our hearts, to help us understand, to give us faith, to believe in you and in your promises. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thanks, Steve. So we are going to be going through quite a bit of John today. That's our, our first three lessons. Uh, if you can turn to John chapter 20, we're going to start off with the race to the tomb. And this is a fun little story that we sometimes talk about on Easter. There's so many different Easter stories. Um, this one, when we were in uh, Israel, there was a gentleman there named Yanis which I believe is Russian for John. And so when we were talking about the tomb, we had a little mock race because Peter and John raced to the tomb. So I always laugh a little bit at this. But we're going to start reading um, at verse 1 in chapter 20. This section is a little bit less than some of the ones we'll be reading in a little while. Are there any volunteers to read John 1 to 10? Jay, you got it? Thank you very much. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from the scripture Thank you very much, Jay. All right, so let's get a little bit of a bearing of where we're at here. So last week, obviously, we covered the resurrection in a very brief amount of time. There was plenty more we could have discussed. Now we are on the third day. And uh, it always kind of confused me with that timing. It's Friday when Jesus is crucified. It's Sunday when he rose. We talk about him being in the tomb for three days. That's not really accurate. He, it's, he rose on the third day. That's what we confess in the creed. So Friday is the first day, Saturday is the second, Sunday is the third day. So if you've ever been confused by that, that's what they say. And that's why we say on the third day. So, Dave, you're welcome, Dave. Yeah, that always 
And we talk about that too with the, uh, the sign of Jonah, Jonah being in the fish for three days. That's not exactly equivalent. Jesus talks about the sign of Jonah, and there's more to it than just that. It's really the idea of Jesus dying, descending into hell, rising again. That's the sign of Jonah. So I don't know if you've ever been confused by that. I have been in the past. So we've got a map of Jerusalem here. We talked about that quite a bit last time. Trials of Jesus, there are several, several trials. They weren't all official trials. Possibly the place of the high priest house here. We do know that the palace of Herod the Great with the courtyard is over in this area, here on the west side of the walls, uh, still within the walls at that time. But then where Jesus is crucified, that's the question of is it at a traditional location of Golgotha, where it's carved out of a rock quarry? There's up in this area what they call the garden tomb, which looks much more like the pictures you'll see in Bible storybooks, where it's a nice, quiet area uh, where there is lots of trees and vegetation. Uh, we didn't go there because there's really no historical evidence that that is what happened there. That's not really where first century tombs are. So Golgotha over here, where Jesus was crucified and where he was buried, is where most people believe it happened, or where most people believe that happened here. So this is outside of the city walls at the time of Jesus. It's now inside the city walls. John? Well, uh, most of the uh, crucifixions were in a fixed place. They didn't radiate holes during right. each crucifixion. There was a specific spot. Left the holes already in there uh, that Romans used the same spots every time they did a crucifixion in that area. Yep, and they had, I don't even know if you'd call it a mass grave, but a place where they would typically just throw the bodies where they were done. And it sunk, as you might expect. So they weren't doing that all over the city. Yeah. So over here is where it's traditionally seen. We talk about the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, so as we talk about Mary Magdalene coming to the tomb early, we're not sure exactly where Mary started, and we'll get into that with the apostles too. It's very possible they started in this area, in the upper room, where they celebrated the first Lord's Supper. It's also possible that they were out here over in Bethany, we talked about that a few weeks ago, and they came in, so we're not sure how far they ran. I think it's probably more likely that they came here running to the tomb that way, and Mary ran back. That's a much shorter run than all the way to Bethany and back. But that's, we don't know for sure. That's just thinking practically. When we were in Israel, we saw a number of tombs. Here's one that I think is really what people think of when they think of a tomb. Something where it's lower down, you've got that nice circular rock that's rolled in front of it, um, you can tell this one is on the edge of a highway. <laughs> and this one is nowhere near Jerusalem. When we were um, there, we were up at Mount Carmel, which is in the northwest side of Israel, right on the Mediterranean Sea. And we were driving to Nazareth through the Jezreel Valley. This is leading up to that. So this is way far away from that. And um, Pastor Zell was telling us, look out the side of your window. We're going to see this tomb. And 20 minutes later, <laughs> we passed the tomb and like slowed down just to take these pictures. This is what you, I typically think of as a tomb. Do you know how old that is, Peter? I do not know that one. Yeah, we it's didn't. Like, doesn't look kind of too perfect, like a movie. So well, exactly. Like yeah. Um, right. And that's why I showed this first because I think that's really what people think of when they think of it. About Ten years old. Right. Ten years old. Now, here is, uh, in this area, this is a park that we went to in Jerusalem. It's a little bit outside the city. We went to this not because there's any historical significance, but because it has this nice visual of what first century tombs around Jerusalem look like. And so this is one, um, this is a, a richer area. Um, these are nicer tombs. It's carved out of the side of a rock. In this case, there's more of an entryway going into the tomb. A little bit further down in the park, we spent some time here at this tomb. And this one you can especially see 
on this side here, how it's the, you know, carved out of the bedrock, the stone quarry. And then we go in here. This is probably a better representation of what that tomb would have been like. Now, there is a stone that was rolled in front of it. We know that. And so there might be some more connections to that first image. But I think this really shows, as opposed to that first one, which is a rock on the side of a, what is now a highway, this is very intentionally carved out. These were not caves that they just kind of converted into tombs. The, uh, this was a, a tomb that was created for the for rich people. You know, that's how they would have been able to afford it. So um, when Joseph of Arimathea took him in there, that's what this kind of thing was. There may have been ornate decorations. And this is the kind of tombs that are around Golgotha there in that area, in that traditional site. So like we talked a few minutes ago, when Mary ran and went to find Simon Peter and the other disciple, uh, we'll talk about that in a second, I'm thinking they probably ran this direction in the arrows there, but there's no nothing in scripture that tells us exactly where they were staying that day, um, so we don't know for sure. Also, in this reading, you'll notice that it doesn't mention John at all. It just says the other disciple. That's uh, in, the, yeah, in the verse two there, the one whom Jesus loved. Um, this is a common way that this disciple is referred to. We believe that's John, who's the author of this gospel. Don? Can it be assumed that they were staying at a place like that where they had the Last Supper? That's you know, close to, you know, to that point, because they mentioned in the Bible several times that uh, they were the first time Jesus appeared, they were in some upper room or something, and that's where they just and then they got the house was there. And, that's my assumption too and we'll talk about that one in the very next section um but yeah that's my assumption too that it's in the upper room that the words that are referred to go back to the night of the last supper so that would be my guess as well um it's pretty explicit when they stay in bethany um so i would think they'd call it out we just don't know for sure because it's not explicit in the text but we can make some safe assumptions i think dave yeah, I got a question. It might be kind of derangential, but where it says the disciple that Jesus loved, mm -hmm. that's not, it's that kind of freaks me out. I mean, the disciple did not love. As if he didn't love the others? Yeah, I mean, that, that, I, mean I know it's not true, but I mean, that's what, you know, I'm just kind of on the gate. I'm like, what do you mean the disciple that you love? You know, because you don't pick out, you get us pick out each one, you know, so that's why I'm. Yeah, that's why I, they think it's the author as a, a way of referring to himself in, um, I don't know the right way to phrase this, not in that he was more special than the others, it's but, a humble right, yeah, there you go, humble brag, but sort of in that reflection of, I am one who has given his love and I'm able to do these things. So it's a way of, uh, not humble bragging, but a, a level of humility to say that I'm only here because I'm beloved. That's kind of the impression I get. I don't know if there's other thoughts in here that, yeah, Don? When, when it refers to the phrase is used quite often in the Gospels. And I'm thinking it's John because it, uh, was it John one of, I mean, quote unquote, Jesus' brother? No, John was the son of Zebedee. Um, so James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the fishermen who were partners with Peter and Andrew. So it wasn't one of his half-brothers, as we call him. That was James. Um, traditionally, it's James. We don't know that for... Who did, who did, when Jesus was on the cross, and he said, Mother, behold, whatever he gave, wasn't that? That is John. No, I thought that was his brother. Oh, no, no, it's not a, a direct relative of his, but he was giving him over, or giving Mary over to John and John to Mary to take care of. Yeah. Was it a common thing for all the disciples to say, why the book to proclaim themselves the one who is loved by John? It was just John who did that. Okay. Yeah, that has, uh, that's a topic of much discussion uh, among many different historical critics and other things. So, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. I think there is a, a level of humility there to not just say, and I was there, like as a way of referring to himself without putting it into the first person. I think that's a better way of what I was trying to say before. So, Art, do you have a thought? Uh, I, I just said, uh, just was thinking, uh, Mark did not know Jesus. He was Peter's translator. Yep. And Luke did not know Jesus either, but it's somebody who was a, a, an associate of Paul, right? Right, yep. Yeah, and Matthew did know Jesus. He was the, the other gospel written by that eyewitness. And, and Mark may have known Jesus, but he was not an apostle. There's thoughts that the, the young man who fled the Garden of Gethsemane was John Mark, but uh, that's not explicit in the text either. So, yeah, there's a lot of assumptions, but unless it says so for sure, we, we have to say there are assumptions. that you know There's good reasons to think of this, but... We don't have it in scripture, so we can't say for sure. Let's go ahead and jump into our first question. This is just a, a recap. So this should be an easy one. Who was the first person to arrive at the tomb? Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, very good. Yep, she arrived there. Now we think based on the other gospels that she's with the other women. As they come to the tomb, she, along with them, sees that it's rolled away. And her first thought is, They've taken Jesus. Doesn't go and look in, so she runs back to say that. Who is the first of the apostles to get there? John. Yep. He's a little bit faster. Yeah. He's probably a little bit younger than Peter, too. All right. Why do you think they ran? Why do you think Peter and John ran? They were excited. They're excited? Say more about that, Jay. Well, they just yeah, so excited, not necessarily in a joyful sense, but in an intrigued kind of sense. Okay. Want to see what was going on. Obviously, yeah, Mary's excited or <laughs> trying to figure out what's, um, or maybe upset is a better way. Rich? You think maybe... I know they have been disciples of Christ, and they, he had told them he would rise on the third day. But in the back of their mind, when he died on Friday, did they really think he was dead and that he, he was done? And now they hear he is alive, and they can't believe it, and they don't see it. I think that's a pretty good bet. Take a look at the text here. Um, look down in... Look in verses 8 and 9. It says, Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as of yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Yeah, I think you're right on with that, Rich. I think that even though they were explicitly told by Jesus, even though they were taught, and, and, and he referred back to the scriptures and said, This is all about me text makes it clear they didn't quite understand what was going on yet. And, and the question as to why that is, maybe Jesus didn't want it revealed to them as such yet, but we know for sure that they didn't quite get it yet. Jay? I was having a bit of a, a problem with 8 9 because it says they went inside, he saw and believed, but then it says they did not yet understand from Scripture that Jesus had rise. So what did they believe? <laughs> yeah, what do you think they believed? All right. Yeah, well, they believed that the, what women told them was true. Yeah. Under normal circumstances, this being the patriarchal culture it was, uh, they would be loath to believe the testimony of a woman. That's an interesting point, yeah. That because of the, the type of society it is, a, a woman's word did not count in the same way that a man's did. And so when she said it, for one, it shows that they believed enough to go and see for themselves and to validate it. But, yeah, that's right, Mary. Nobody ever, ever mentions the Roman guard, but they weren't there anymore. Right. They were guarding the tomb. Yeah, the Roman guards were no longer there, so it's possible if the guards aren't there and the body's not there, would you say? They yeah. took them or they ran away. Right. <laughs> exactly. Now, one of the things that's interesting here, and again, there is so much we can talk about, it, but if you look at um, 
Second half of uh, verse 6, going into verse 7. This is Peter. He saw the linen cloth lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. So that's what they see in there. Does that sound like something that would happen if the grave was robbed, if they uh, took him away to give an impression? Done. We don't know. I wouldn't know what he did back there, but I know if somebody goes into my house, they're not going to like clean it up for me. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, and so Peter sees this. He connects with what Jesus said about rising from the grave. He's probably putting the pieces together, but maybe he doesn't understand the whole picture still. That's my thought when it says that. Uh, Yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. They may not have understood all of the implications of what that meant for them and their salvation. Rich? I think one of the things we had talked about Tuesday morning Bible study is exactly what you're saying. That cloth was folded up nicely. They took their time. And if you pastor made the observation when we were studying Mark, when Lazarus came out of the tomb, Lazarus was covered in burial clothes. Mm -hmm. And had Jesus been robbed or taken away, as you put it, then it wouldn't have been a nice, cleaned up bedroom, remade, <laughs> the like of that. Uh, and, 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 yeah. and the cause probably would have been taken with him, too. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Brett. Yeah, don't, don't forget, too, that Jesus was anointed when he was buried, too. So that cloth would have been more valuable yeah, you're absolutely right. That was not just some cheap thing thrown over him. Like he was buried in a expensive first century tomb. You know, it was not just a cave, and he was anointed that way. So yeah, very good point. There was value in that. So grave robbers would not have just abandoned that with it too. Well, let's take this and apply it to ourselves. Talk about how the apostles, they're explicitly told by Jesus what happened. They witness that he's not there, and yet they don't fully understand. In what ways can we fail to fully understand, understand Scripture? Don? So one thing that I don't understand to this day is Jesus, I don't know how many times people have said that he showed himself to the apostles and all this stuff, but nobody on that was only the believers that ever saw him. It wasn't, you know, the rest of us, he just walked around and nobody could see him except these guys. Well, you've seen by a lot of people. Um, well, I think it says in uh, later on, over 500 people saw him. Yeah, but what, why didn't any of them? They weren't mentioned that they were disbelievers and now they believed because they saw him. Yeah, it doesn't really clarify who all saw him besides the people that we know had direct encounters with him. Obviously, the apostles did, the women did, Mary Magdalene did. So, you know, are they believers because, did he appear to them because they're believers? Are they believers because he appeared to them? Um, we're not really sure. What we do know, though, is there was a lot of eyewitnesses who affirmed this and then went out and told everybody. That's what we do know. Art? There's comparison to be made here between the story of Jesus and the story of Socrates of Athens because uh, in terms of, uh, well, in two terms. First of all, neither Socrates nor Jesus wrote anything down. Secondly, a bunch of people wrote about their experiences with Jesus and with Socrates. Right now, we've only got little bitty pieces regarding Socrates uh, other than the works of Plato and the works of Xenophon, both of whom were his disciples. So uh, we don't have, there's a bunch of other guys like Simeus and Cebes who were there when he died. There was uh, another guy named Iskines who was also his disciple. Those guys wrote stuff down about Socrates, but it went poof. We don't hardly have <laughs> Hardly any of that stuff. That's interesting. You bring up a really good point about the difference between believing because we've read about things 
versus the fact that these things actually happen and people told about them. that witness that eyewitness testimony about these people is what have carried this on and on uh, one of the questions posed to us the first week of seminary was if we didn't have the bible would we still be christians and it's a question i hadn't been asked before and the initial gut reaction is well we believe because the bible tells me so no we believe because it's true the bible tells about it the bible is the inspired word of god we're not downplaying the bible at all but the bible is not the bedrock of our faith jesus is the bedrock of our faith it's because of what happened that we believe and so it kind of goes to what you're saying it's we believe because this happened people testify about it they wrote scriptures inspired by the Holy Spirit to continue that testimony even after they were gone. But it's not, you know, this is not just a proof document. Like, it happened. That's why we believe that. Don? Going to your point a little bit further is the fact that why do we have schools? And, you know, why do they teach math? Why do they teach algebra? They do it because of all the parents are kids smart. They say, token. Uh, is passed down from this generation to this generation. You know, yeah. basic math is taught in the home before you get to school. And that's what, you know, did we need the Bible? No, but it was a way to read and what we already had learned when we were kids from our mother and father. Yeah, absolutely. Somebody made the comparison why do we believe that George Washington was real? Right. Is it we have, I don't think we have actual pictures. We have uh, artists. Uh, yeah, we don't have photographs, but we do have pictures. He's on dollar bills. Yeah, that's right. Well, we talk about him, and we don't have any like one text that says George Washington was real. We believe him because he was real. You know, we've got the stories. We've it's a lot closer than Jesus was in terms of history, but it's the same kind of thing. People pass this on. There's documents written about him. We believe it because it really happened. Like, we believe Napoleon's real. That really happened. Like, you start putting that into that historical context that takes Jesus out of Scripture and puts him in our real world. Yeah, he was here. He really did do the things that he said he was going to do. People witnessed it. So getting back to our question, in what ways can we not understand Scripture? I mean, there, there's a lot of answers, but think about it in those contexts. When we think about what actually happened and what Scripture says, when can we start to be confused? Art? The thing that gets you about Scripture, the thing that can happen, no matter what kind of words you are reading, if you are reading a poem, if you are reading um, the history of Herodotus versus the history of Thucydides, uh, or let's say Tacitus, uh, you are here looking at that text with a certain number of predispositions on your part. And certain words will tip you off that this is the meaning of it when that is simply your predisposition as to how that works. So there's no wonder that we would misinterpret scripture because you know, I mean, look how many different sects of Christianity there are, and people who say they're Christians, but they're not quite orthodox. You know, all that stuff is all that stuff is true. So yeah. How are you going to do it? You got to read it. You got to read it. Yeah, we misunderstand it when we bring our own thoughts and assumptions, uh, predispositions to the text, and not read it for what it is, which is the story of Christ, of what actually happened. John, you got your hand raised before well, I go. Uh, you can read the same scripture over and over again and come up with different perspectives from reading the same words and get different perspectives from reading. But, you know, I understand it this way the first time I read it. Now I picked this up and I understand it this way. Yeah, you think about the difference between reading a text now and, and five years ago, ten years ago. You're at a different place in your life. There's different things that are happening. And you're bringing all of that to the text. I think the key thing is, is if we try to understand scriptures based on us alone, what we read into the text, we can often go off the rails. 
And that's why we come to church. We hear the word preached, come to Bible study. We study scriptures in community so that that faith that has been passed on from generation to generation helps to shape our understanding. And it's not just us coming to the text and trying to apply our predispositions. Art? That's also why there are creeds. Yeah, exactly. The creeds are extraordinarily important in crystallizing for you what the beliefs are. So anytime you're confronted with something else, you can say, no, wait a minute, that's right jive with yeah. the creeds. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The creeds are our profession of faith that we as the Christian church have said, this is what we believe. So as you read scripture, if you start to go off of that, that's where it norms you and puts you back in. Yeah, because again, it all is based on Christ, what he has done, what actually happened. Not just the text here, this describes it, but it starts with him first. Good. I hope that makes sense. We could talk about that all day. We've got at least three more sections of scripture, and I know we're not going to get through all of it. All right, this next section uh, is a little bit longer. Uh, why don't we divide this up into two readers if we can. Uh, one reading 19 to 23 and one reading 24 to 29. I have a couple volunteers. Brett, you got the first part and then who's got the second thing? Thanks, Beth. All right, go ahead. Thank you both. Appreciate it. All right. So again, our setting is this upper room. We talked about that a little while ago. This upper room is not the actual upper room. Uh, this was built well after the first century, but this is an example of what it might have looked like. This is the place where they kind of honor that. It's kind of weird because you know going into this, this is not the place where the last supper was. Uh, we know that. But it gives you a kind of an idea of what this sort of upper room might have been in. And so you can picture the, the 11 up there, or 10 in this case, and they were, they had the door shut. Let's just jump to our first question, and we'll dig into that a little bit more. They had the door shut, they were locked, and it says there that they were, for um, doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Why were they afraid? This might seem simple, but... Art? Well, uh, these guys were in a renegade sect of Jews. They perhaps should have said, for fear of the other Jews. Because those guys were Jews. <laughs> that's, that's a good point. I wasn't thinking of that. But yeah, they were Jews. Fear yeah, of the so, other Jews. So John has this special animus toward them and just calls them the Jews. Yeah. But uh, everybody's a Jew in that place. And, uh, <laughs> Nobody likes renegade sects. Mm -hmm. And back then, where uh, the people who um, who uh, enforced orthodoxy, if you will, and that would be the guys who ran the temple, because they had their own security forces. You know, you could count on being treated 
very badly by those folks, yeah. even uh, by the application of, uh, let's say, stones to your forehead. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that's interesting that I have always kind of glossed over is how many times the Jews, the the other renegade Jews, the, the other Jews than these apostles, um, the Jewish leaders, when they plan to stone Jesus. Like you see that several times throughout scripture and it doesn't happen, but that's what they wanted to do. And I never pictured of Jesus being stoned as a possibility. Like we always think about Jesus in the crucifixion, but yeah, that's what they wanted to do. And we've talked before about how these Jewish leaders in very few times, they did come out against the apostles, usually when Jesus wasn't around. Um, Jesus isn't physically there right now, even though they know that he's not in the tomb, he's not by them. And so they're kind of like sheep without a shepherd at that point. Not in the same way that uh, Jesus referred to the people following him before, but they're not protected by Jesus, if you will. So they're on their own. And obviously they just saw Jesus crucified. So yeah, they're afraid of them because there's a good chance that they could be next. Let's talk about Thomas a little bit. Why do you think Thomas did not believe the others? Jay? Well, maybe he thought it was too good to be true. Too good to be true? Yeah, that's quite possible. I mean, what better news is there than to hear that Jesus is alive? Dave? Well, after Thomas seen what he was doing and everything, would you believe that they were alive? I mean, come on, you saw him being fast and hammered and stuff, you know? If somebody said, Jesus, I would be safe to have right Give me another beer, what you drink? You know? <laughs> I mean, yeah, skepticism. Absolutely. Uh, um, yeah. I believe what I think. I mean, I would not believe it. Would you? You know what I'm saying? Well, what do we know about Thomas? What do you guys know of besides this encounter here? There's not much. We know one thing. He's called Didymus, which means twin. There's only two other times in the Gospels that Thomas shows up. Let's turn to John chapter 11. And take a look around there. We'll read verse 16. But just to give you the uh, context, you can just look at the titles there, what's going on. John chapter 11. Oops. Yes. 16. So what's going on there? The death of Lazarus. Death of Lazarus. So um, give me a quick summary of that, Jay. You know, Lazarus was Mary and Martha's brother. And he was sick, and they wanted Jesus to come, but Jesus waited two or three days, and then he died. And then he came and uh, raised him from the tomb. Yeah. So we are before that last part where Jesus is being told that he needs it. He waits, and then he says, all right, let's go. Um, we have this fun little interaction where Jesus says, well, he's fallen asleep, and he's like, he means he died, and they're like, well, if he's falling asleep, he'll get better. Like, no, let me just tell you plainly. He died. Let's go. And so they're worried because now he's going where, you know, to Bethany, which is right near Jerusalem, where they know that the Jews are wanting to kill him. And so verse 16, we say, we read, So Thomas called the twin, Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. So we know that Thomas here is brought up at the time of Lazarus, right before he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. So that kind of gets to your point, Dave, of, well, this is incredible news. Who would believe this? But Thomas is mentioned here with an emphasis at this narrative of, of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, that he knows Jesus can raise people from the dead. So it's an interesting kind of... Uh, a thing where he says, where you said, Dave, Dave, that he, you know, it's unbelievable. We've got this direct connection to one of the other most famous resurrections in Scripture. So then we have a another one, John 14. Oh, yeah, go. Yeah. I don't know if I'm saying what he means. Oh, sure. Yeah. 
So this is getting near the end of Jesus's earthly ministry. He's had a number of run-ins with the Jewish leaders. They've threatened to stone him. He kind of stays away from Jerusalem for a little while when all this is kind of heat, heating up. And then he says, all right, let's go. Let's go to Lazarus. So Thomas is seeing this as he's going to go where the trouble is. They're going to try to kill him. Do we leave him on his own or should we go and, and die with him? He kind of sees the writing on the wall that Jesus is, you know, there's a death sentence out for Jesus and he's headed right into the midst of it. So my, yeah. Can you say that a little bit louder for the benefit of the rest? Pardon me? Do you mind repeating that for the rest of the group? No, I don't no. remember what I said. <laughs> <laughs> In what? chapter 12, it tells us that the, the plan was to kill him and Lazarus. They okay. were going to get them both, but they're going to wait until after the, the celebration because there were too many people that were on Jesus' side. And so uh, it was public knowledge that to go there where Lazarus was, was you were treading on, on deadly ground, can yep. you say? And they were going to kill everybody. So Yeah, exactly. Thomas said, let's go. We'll, we can follow on with them. We'll put up with it. Yep. Yeah. They, they, he knew the danger that was going in, and he didn't back down. But it, the danger is real. Dave, you have a follow? I don't know. Can you compare this like how Peter said that I will die for you, that kind of stuff. And then, so at that time, Thomas did have belief in Christ. He said, okay, let's go and fight the fear the back man. You know what I'm saying? Because they're going to kill him, so let's go fight him. Is that kind of similar to I, I think so, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, this goes back to what we were talking about a little while ago, where the apostles, you know, Jesus told them plainly what was going to happen. So they knew about it, but they may not have fully understood the big picture, that this had to happen, that Jesus had to die and rise again. This was part of his plan. So yeah, I think they understood a lot of it, but they didn't understand the big picture of why this was happening. And so yeah, they knew because he told them they're gonna, he was going to die. And, um, and so they're like, all right, well, if he's going, we're following him. Let's die too then. Why the thing that I just don't, I struggle with this all the time is why did Christ die for me? And for because I mean, I the, some of the things that I do, I should know better. I've been taught, but yet I do them anyway. Yeah, and it, uh, it's kind of, and it's the only thing I can come up with is that's how much He loves us, and that's how much. Uh, uh, I mean, that goes back to grace. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think everybody runs into that when you look at yourself and you can see your outward side actions and those are bad mm -hmm. enough. But then when you see what's inside you, what's inside your heart, and you realize just how corrupt and horrible you are. And you think Jesus, the son of God, would die for me? And the answer is yes. Yes, he would. He did that for you. And he says it's for you. That promise is for you. And it may seem unbelievable, but it's true. And that's when you know, we can be tempted to start thinking that we have done too much, that he couldn't possibly forgive us. And that's when we, we can rely on his promises that are true. He rose again. We know it's true. He is strong enough to rise from the dead. He's certainly strong enough to forgive us. Yeah, good point, Don. Let's turn to... To John chapter 14, verse 5. This is the other section that Thomas has mentioned. This is after Jesus washes his feet, right after he foretells Peter's denial. And then we get a note here. Um, Jesus says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also, and you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. 
how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We know that one, that verse 6 there, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. I often forget that's a response to Thomas's question. So we get this picture of Thomas where we know of him as doubting Thomas, where that's what we hear about. But there's two pretty significant other things in there. One, we have the Thomas who is, is brave and saying, all right, we're going to go and, and die with them. And then we have the one who's asking for more details, who's wanting to know more. I get this picture of Thomas that he's really a thinker, that he's engaged with the situation. He's trying to figure out what's going on. He's trying to make sense of all of that. And, and that's a different thing, at least to me, than to say he's doubting. But what is it? Yeah, let's go to our next question, because there's a, a really key part in this. Let's go turn right back to John chapter 20. Verse 27, and he says, Put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it at my side. Do not disbelieve but believe. You've got Thomas who's trying to figure this out. And Jesus says, let me help you figure it out. <laughs> you know, whether he truly meant beforehand that he wanted to put his finger in Jesus' hand, put his hand in his side, or whether he was just throwing that out as a term, Jesus is saying, all right, we're going to work this out right now. We're going to figure this out. We're going to remove any sort of misunderstanding, any disbelief that you have, and you're going to believe. I'm going to do what I need to do to help you believe. One of the things I like about this, and we talk about this a lot with God the Father, that God spoke and it happened. God spoke and he created the world. And we often put the power of God's word with the creator God. But as we talked right at the beginning of this study, when Jesus commanded the stormy waves to stop, Jesus, he, as one person of the Trinity, he is God. He controls all of creation. His word does stuff. He spoke and calmed the seas. He speaks here to Thomas and says, do not disbelieve, but believe. Jesus gave Thomas the faith that he needed to believe he is resurrection, resurrected. Thomas, was, Thomas answered him, he says, my Lord and my God. Jesus says, believe, and Thomas believed, and he professed his faith. And I think this says far more about what Jesus is doing in the situation than what Thomas is doing. Thomas had his doubts. He's, we've got three instances in scripture of him trying to figure things out. He's not shy about asking the questions. But it's about what Jesus does here. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And his word causes Thomas to believe. Does that make sense? For me, when I thought about that way, it was kind of a paradigm shift. Like, okay, it's not so much Thomas's disbelief that we learn from. It's we learn what Jesus does in these situations. Jesus is the one who creates faith in people. So to our question, how do we respond to others' disbelief? What's our typical response when somebody says they don't believe in Jesus? What do, what do we want to do? We want them to believe. We want them to believe, yeah. I don't know about you. My inclination is to try to prove it, to try to explain it. Does anybody else feel like that? Art? Yeah, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it has to do with uh, the historicity of this guy. He's for real, and he was referred to not simply in the Gospels, the letters of Paul, the letters of Peter, the, le the letter of James, but he was also to be found in uh, Josephus. Mm -hmm. Flavius Josephus puts him in there as part of that particular time. Uh, the aftermath of Jesus is covered by Suetonius, and also in the book, uh, in the Annals of Tacitus as well, where 
Jesus shows up as a figure who caused dissension among the Jews. You have two different sects of Jews colliding, and so what does the Emperor Claudius do? He boots him out of Rome, and yeah. that's also confirmed in uh, the Book of Acts. Yeah, you start going through this, it's called apologetics, where you are basically show, stating the case for Christ. And there's a lot that you can state. Like you said, outside of Scripture, outside the church, there's plenty of evidence that points to Christ and that he really existed at this time and place. He was really killed there by the Jews. Like There's a lot of historical evidence for it. And that's the first incl inclination we have because in our own sinful nature, we want to prove that we are right, that what we believe is true. I just realized my time, we're already over. So, Don, I'll let you... Uh, it, it's mostly historical, but unfortunately there was a, you can go back and prove that there was a man named Jesus and this and this. And then they, they look at the four Gospels and they say, well, they're kind of the same, but they're not the same. And, well, guess what? If they were the same, that would probably mean that it isn't true because... You know, it's kind of like word of mouth. I'll tell you a story. And it goes sure. Down the line. Yeah, the game of telephone kind of. Thing. Yeah, I think there's all sorts of things that we can point to and say, yeah, this is believable. But what we have to remember on is our faith, it remembers that our faith is not based on facts that align themselves together and start to make sense. Our faith is because Jesus gives us faith through the power of the Holy Spirit through our baptism, he creates that faith in us. He said to Thomas, believe. He says to us, believe. And so when others have disbelief, we have to remember that we don't have to convince them to believe. It's not what we do. It's what Jesus does for them. He creates that faith. He is working through our witness, certainly, but through his means of grace, he creates the faith. And that, yeah, Pastor Whitmer. When you confront somebody who doesn't believe you question them don't be defensive about jesus yeah so what don't you believe yeah make them explain what they don't believe they'll be it'll be surprising how much they know about jesus the whole thing yeah i you... had an experience in the hospital where the guy in the bed next called me with all the bad names in the world he was a town atheist i would have married him when i the lord gave me two weeks with him every day and uh, by the time he got done explaining what he didn't believe, he believed. <laughs> you, you let Christ work through those situations. He will work through you and your witness, but it's not dependent on you and the words that you say. It's all dependent on him. He's the one who creates that faith. And that last question there to our own disbelief, that goes to what we were talking about before with Don. Like He works and he creates faith in us when we have disbelief when we are worried about things it's him that restores that belief it's through the power of the holy spirit that that faith is in us and so we just turn to him well we could talk about this all day we got through two sections there's more to talk about next week but i'm way over time so um let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer lord god thank you again for this time to study your word thank you for the assurance that you are the one who causes us to believe because you died and rose again and fulfilled all your promises. Lord, give us the strength of your Holy Spirit to cling to those promises as we go about our daily lives and share your love with others. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much, everybody. Sorry to go over time. I enjoy talking about this way too much. Thank you.